Hello and welcome to this edition of the Halcyon Podcast. My name is Lon Rice. I'm going to be a host for this edition. This is going to be the sports podcast. So no pro wrestling, no general social media stuff, just pure sports. So there's one of you who I know can definitely give this miss. Everybody else, get yourself nice and comfy. And let's tune in. So what are we going to be talking about on this podcast? A couple of things. Talking about football, uh, so Wayne Rooney's recent inclusion to the England squad and the wider ramifications, Arsenal's form, because I'm a big Arsenal fan, the Sturridge betting scandal now that it's kind of settled down a little bit and the Ballon d'Or nominees, who should be, who shouldn't be. I'm going to be talking a little bit about boxing, uh, Tyson Fury, Gentle Wilder, since that's coming up very, very shortly. And we're going to be talking about MMA. So... Uh, specifically uh, UFC related issues but also the recent bout between Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz so let's kick things off with sports Wayne Rooney recently received an England cap what's so noteworthy about this specifically the reason why this is noteworthy is that he retired two years ago year and a half ago uh, around the time that he started playing for Everton and then decided to go to DC United. Why is he getting the cap then? Well, he has a charity that has some exposure in America now that he's become more prominent over there. The friendly that he was given the cap for, or the, the competitive match, whatever, well, I don't know, it was against America. And so every, every circumstances dictated that people floated the idea about him being charitable and uh, exposing his charity, utilizing the England setup. Why is this work? worth talking about well it wasn't in my eyes until i saw an edition of the sunday supplement which is a show that i use for reference in terms of the bs that the footballing media like to perpetuate specifically two members of the panel not seeing an issue with rooney being given an england cap for the express purpose of a convergence of circumstances rather than him being picked on merit or form and the slippery slope that this presents because whenever you set a precedent for something whether you knowingly or unknowingly do it it opens the door for other people because now a criteria has been set and a standard has been administered so so long as you meet that criteria you can always point to this as reference to say well how can hang on a second why can't i do it when he did it i do this i've got this and this is when it has to happen this is exactly the same sort of situation. And that's a, a, an issue for football. Because in a time where we as fans are becoming more and more marginalised in, in the kind of influence that we can have on the game due to the fact that ticket sales are becoming less and less of an avenue for uh, revenue streams for clubs. Yes, we're still an integral part of the sport because if no one's watching advertising is worth wank but at the same time they almost know you're going to watch so they're not that concerned with whether or not you're going to watch and it's a question of what, what do we want to do okay so the reason I have the main issue I have with this is, is again on the Sunday supplement when they talk about this they you can tell instantly that they've got an agenda that they're trying to push. This isn't necessarily some... Because contrary to popular belief, journalists are incredibly intelligent and wily individuals. Why do I say this? Because they have to navigate the quagmire and the shark-infested pit that is the journalistic avenue of employment. There's always going to be that next person who's going to try and want that scoop that you've been working on. There's going to be that next person who's willing to break a story before you are with less, net, with net less uh, information than you do it's it's a slippery slope this Rooney situation it demeans and lessens the England cap it demeans and lessens international football as a whole and some people might point to lesser teams that have uh, players that aren't full-time professionals uh, players that uh, are not international standard playing against others because you know the country they represent uh, players choosing countries to play for because of prestige. Uh, players choosing countries because they've got a better chance of playing. 
I understand all those arguments, but this is a very direct situation. This is a situation where there was already criteria, criteria, I'm Roy Hodgson always had me, criteria already in place. Was he good enough to be selected for the England squad? No, Wayne Rooney's time has come and passed. He is now, he could be an ambassador. I, I'm not saying that his participation in the game couldn't have been there to some extent, but to pick him, put him on the bench, rob a, a spot that someone else had earned for the sake of a commercial enterprise and people saying, oh, well, it, it didn't matter anyway, you know, so why was everyone getting, well, if it didn't matter, why are you putting him there then? You can't make the argument that it's worth doing if it doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter, no one will be watching. But it does matter because people were watching and it's also the reason why you thought it'd be a good idea. So it does matter. So that renders that argument null and void. And you just gotta wonder what comes next. I mean, the one that sticks out for me in terms of, this wasn't uh, necessarily for commercial purposes, this was just, uh, this, and I would argue that this is a self-ingratiating deed. This is Wayne Rooney pulling some fucking strings. John Terry, stopping a Premier League football match because the minute ticked onto the shirt number that he wears. I mean, wh what? Or however many years he was at Chelsea or whatever. I can't remember. I think his number's 23. Or I, I don't know. I'm not a Chelsea fan, so I don't give a fuck. But stopping a match at that point for everyone to... Hang on. This is a competitive game. What, what, what the argument is, oh, well, you know, we're position secured and it's not that this is about, this is what football's about. No, it isn't. Football's not about individuals having moments and, and uh, having their fucking ego stroked because of who they are. Football is about the moments that footballers and fans create within the game. That's what football's about. And this situation draws emphasis on the fact that that's what the people who run football are trying to turn away from. We're trying to turn away from the magic and the and the majesty of a sporting moment. And they're trying to manufacture moments. Like, isn't this great? Wayne Rooney, he's coming back into the England fold. He's, And it's with the Americans who's building this time for. And it's, it's for charity, man. Yeah, but is he good enough to be put on an England shirt? Is he better than Rashford right now? Is he better than uh, Jamie Vardy is right now? He retired. Should he get a call up and say, dude, bring a charity? No, of course not. So why is Wayne Rooney any different? Because he has some pull, because he has some stroke, and that's it. I'd be interested to hear what other people think about this, because in the wider context, I think many people probably don't care as much. But I think this is, if this is, if there are other examples in sport, I'd like to hear about them. But this is a bad one for football. This is an example that I hope isn't emulated anywhere else. Ah, uh, it's, it's a bad one. It really is. Anyway, let's move on to uh, Arsenal's form. We are playing Bournemouth as we speak. And at last check, uh, I understand that... Uh, oh, hush. Apologies. This is going to be a really... I will probably just pause here for a second to apologise. Two things. Number one, uh, this podcast has been written to a certain degree. I've got some points. However, it has come at a really shit time. I, for some reason have a pain right at the base of my tongue like on the underside which makes it very difficult to talk usually and this is going to grow some people out this is supposed to be a sports podcast whenever i have something in my mouth like an abscess or something i just pop the fucking thing gargle salt for a day or two and it's fine last couple of days i've been trying fucking everything lozenges uh plenty of protein plenty of vitamin c uh, everything I could possibly think of to try and get rid of this bastard thing. And I even, like I said, tried to flip my tongue over the other day and see if there's anything I can just squeeze until it pops. But no, fucking nothing. It's just a pain in my tongue and it refuses to fucking go away, which makes it unfortunately very difficult to talk, which is why you're hearing a lot of poisons in my speech. It's the reason why I'm having to try and keep my mouth nice and moist. And it's why the flow of the podcast is going to suffer as a result. So I apologize for you. She probably should have said that at the beginning of the podcast. But anyway, let's move on. Arsenal's form. We were going to talk about that. So let's talk about Arsenal's form for a second. It's been okay. 
it's been okay. But why do I want to talk about it in the wider sense? Well, if you look at where we are in the league, and you look at our standing within the wider scope of football, what has really changed from now to when Wenger was in charge beyond... Wenger was inconsistent, but we ended up sort of finishing where we should have finished. Third, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. Here's the thing though. At present, Arsenal sit after 13 games with 27 points, which is actually reasonably respect respectable. But we're in fifth position. We are eight points off City's pace, six off of Liverpool's, three behind Tottenham and a point behind Chelsea. Now, people might say, well, that's not a lot and yada, yada, yada. Out of those five teams, we're joint last on goal difference, which means we're still leaking goals left, right and centre. As it stands at the moment, Arsenal are currently winning against Bournemouth 2-1 at 67 minutes gone. So hopefully we win this game. It's uh, it's a weird time to be an Arsenal fan because the early optimism from Emery is still holding. I think a lot of Arsenal fans are still quite happy with his performance and how he's guiding the team. My issue is, okay, fair enough. He's had a transfer window and we've got some players in that we really like. Torreira, Guanduzzi, uh, Abamyang and Lacazette are really settling in. Ozil looks like he's going to stay. But it, the situation hasn't improved. We're still in fifth place. We're still in the Europa League. Our best chance at a trophy is the FA Cup or the League Cup. So my question is, where is the outrage now? Is the outrage subsided because, oh, well, you've got to give him time. You know, he's only been in the job three or four months. Fine. But the outcry isn't really there at the moment for giving the performances. There's, I wouldn't say we've had an amazing, world-beating, mind-blowing performance yet. Say what you like about Wenger, but at the least, there'd be performances where you just had to sit back and go, wow, that is some amazing football. Like, truly mind-blowing football. Emery doesn't seem to play that kind of... I've not heard anyone come out and say Emery's brand of football is particularly mind-blowing. Maybe it's more functional. Maybe with more time, it'll come to pass. But when you consider that at the present moment, we will still not qualify for the Champions League unless we win the Europa, which he's won with uh, on three occasions. I will grant you that. But the situation hasn't improved. So here's the question I would want Arsenal fans to answer for me is what is success going forward for the club? When Man City are prepared to outspend everybody else with potentially the best coach in the world. I don't think many people would argue that fact unless you're a United fan. You've got Liverpool now up in the ante by spending money of their own, even though I don't know how long that's really sustainable. Tottenham will be going into their new stadium shortly. And yes, that's going to put them in a financial hole for a while. But they've the core of their team is still going to remain, broadly speaking, the same for years to come. You've got Chelsea, who are in the midst of their own restructuring process, but they're a point ahead of us. And at some point, and as, 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 as remiss as I am to say this, United will get their shit together at some point. I don't think it's... It's amazing that they're on minus one goal difference right now. That's how poor their form's been. And they're stuck in seventh place. They're six points behind us. But they'll get their shit together. They're too big a club not to get their shit together sooner or later. Too big a commercial enterprise with too much money flowing into the club for them to not get it right at some point. They've got more of a chance than Liverpool, in my opinion, of getting to the title before C. Not this season, obviously, but at some stage. So where do Arsenal go from here? You can't invest any more money because the, the fucking Kroenke is not going to give you any. 
I don't think this team can perform any better than they can at the moment. The defence is what it is. Um, Leno is going to have to grow into his role as a number one. Uh, the defence is, again, you've got better, who's a great, who's a great player. Socrates, who it seems is lacking for pace, but we need, we really need Koscielny back in the fold, just as competition for Socrates or Mustafi. Um, but every, everywhere else on the pitch is, I would argue, optimal level. You know, Aubameyang is the best striker that we could have possibly hoped for. Lacazette and him building up a good partnership, rapport, retaining Ozil. These are all amazing players. And yet we sit fifth. That's how competitive this league is these days. That's how far ahead our competition are from us. So what constitutes success? Is it finishing top four? In which case, <laughs> what was the point in all the uproar about getting rid of Wenger? This is why I hate the inconsistency and the fickleness of, of football fans. Because on the whole, we'd probably be in the same position. And it's hard for Arsenal to accept, but maybe, maybe we're not that big a deal anymore. Maybe our time has come and passed. Maybe we have to suffer another 10 years of mediocrity. Maybe we have to suffer through City having a period of dominance only for their owners to spectacularly pull the plug or uh, for Liverpool to capitulate or Spurs to go bankrupt or Chelsea to finally lose, lose the plot altogether before we can have a real crack at the title. No matter how good we can be at the moment, maybe it just isn't good enough. When you consider the financial muscle that Liverpool and City are expending, the stability that Tottenham are going to have going forward, and considering that they're currently ahead of us in the standings, and the fact that Chelsea can just always pull it out at some point, there's always that if factor with Chelsea. Are they going to have a good season or a bad season? Good season, they could win the title. Bad season, they might be nowhere. And then United's resurgence. And there's also Everton to consider, because they've got some fucking money to throw around now, man. Give it time with them because they're going to figure out something sooner or later. They're only five points behind us. So my curiosity would be from Arsenal fans is what is success going forward for Arsenal Football Club? I don't know the answer to that. I just think it's an interesting question considering the fact that we are where we are irrespective of if Wenger's in charge or if Emery's in charge. So fascinating stuff. Time will tell how things play out. So uh, I'll just talk briefly on the Sturridge issue, so uh, Sturridge, like footballers before and will do in the future, uh, has been caught, uh, basically, well, he's, he's been uh, reprimanded for illegally betting. Um, it's an interesting one. You've got to understand that for a footballer in this day and age, the money is stupid. I don't mean legitimately stupid. When you get your head around some of the figures that they talk about, even a baseline Premier League player who can earn 30, 40, 50, 60,000 pounds a week. Now, I will be completely upfront. I have never earned that in a year. So there you go. Times that by 52. And that gives you an idea that I would have to work the majority, if not the entirety of my life, to earn what some of these bastards earn in a year. The financial, my financial security would be set with the salary of one year of these motherfuckers for the rest of my life. And I would imagine this is the same for a lot of people who, who are listening to this. And yet, they go bankrupt, they make financial decisions that baffle some of us, and then there's some that gamble. And you go, well, hang on a second. If you gamble, it's because you want to accrue more wealth or you're seeking some kind of thrill or excitement. There's legal and slightly more profitable ways of doing that. Why do it? Well, because footballers are fallible human beings like the rest of us. And the last I checked, they're young men who don't necessarily have all the life experience that they'll need. They're often surrounded by a lot of people who just say, yes, 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 this is a great idea, you should do this, as so long as you're lending me some money, or as so long as you're supporting me through my experience, uh, as part of my entourage, or you're paying my mortgage payment, or whatever. And I think it's an interesting thing to reflect on, that 
no, no matter, because Sturridge, I think, at the peak of his powers was probably earning. If he wasn't earning six figures a week, it was damn close. He was earning three to five million pounds a year, easily. He had to have been. Had to have been. And yet he gets caught gambling. It just goes to show that money doesn't buy you happiness. Money can alleviate some of life's pressures for a while, but we all live within our means. Every single one of us. Doesn't matter if I gave you if I gave you ten million pounds tomorrow. You're not paying off all your debts, buying your house off, renovating your house to make sure it's nice, and then putting the rest in the bank. You're selling your house. You're buying a bigger house. You're selling your car. You're buying three nicer ones. You're going on holiday and spending money on fucking everything. On a whim. And so you look at your bank balance one day and you realise, holy shit, I can't afford the next mortgage payment. I can't, uh, I can't afford uh, the next down payment on my next car. That investment I made has gone awry. I've lost all that money. It's an amazing time we live in where footballers can earn such an astronomical amount of money and yet still find ways to fuck up, considering that all they would really need to do is hire a financial manager. But it's a cautionary tale for all of us mere mortals who earn mere mortal money that so long as you're smart with your money, you may end up in a better position than some of these guys. With all the wealth that they'll accrue and the stardom and the fame... Hey, it's not always all what it's not always what it's always cracked up to be. So, uh, the last topic I was going to talk about, I think I'll leave for now, because we're still a ways away from the Ballon d'Or ceremony, and anything could happen between now and then. Besides, I think I need to draw up my own list of nominees who I would put forward and justify them, not just with stats, but also with the impact that they've had on the team. So, we'll leave that topic for now. So, let's move on. Let's move on to boxing. Let's talk about Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder facing off for the WBC World Heavyweight Championship. I've got Fury to win, as I've said on many occasions. I've seen nothing since and nothing prior to indicate to me that Deontay Wilder has the boxing ability, uh, the physical prowess, or indeed the KO power necessary to defeat Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury is still one of the slickest heavyweight boxers I want to say of recent times, but I want to go even further. It's hard to, to really sell to people unless you've watched one of his fights and been bored to death by them. Why are you bored to death with him? Well, the other bloke is really struggling to land anything of consequence. He hits a lot. But Tyson Fury is a master of nullifying offense. With his size, his hand speed, his superior footwork, and his willingness to disengage from time to time. He is not an exciting boxer by any stretch of the imagination, but he is technically superior to Wilder in every way. Wilder's stamina always gets called into question because he just throws bombs and hooks and overs that... He has no intention of, of following up through. He just wants to knock you out in the one hit. I think an interesting fight for Wilder would have been Joseph Parker prior to this fight. Because I think that would have given us a real sense of how Wilder can handle a legitimate heavyweight contender. Even though Parker was a world champion, I will give you that. I would argue that until there is a dis undisputed champion, there's not really anyone that I would suggest to you is the undisputed... Well, by definition, but anyway, you know what I mean. They're all contending to be the best. But while they all have world championships, they all lay claim. AJ's is the strongest because he possesses the majority of the belts, sure. But because he's not undisputed king, there's always that question mark. Could he actually take a punch from Wilder? Could he actually outbox... Tyson Fury? Would he last in a rematch with Dillian White? Um, could Joseph Parker figure him out if he got a rematch? Considering his bout with Pulev, that threw a lot of questions into the mix. So, where do I think it goes from here? Because again, I've given my prediction. Tyson Fury will beat Wilder. I'm supremely confident that it will not be a knockout. It will be a 12-round decision. 
but because it's being held in America, Wilder has the advantage in almost every way. He has been more active, he has the title, he has the home advantage. But boxing is boxing, and Tyson Fury will put in enough offense, and he will defuse Deontay Wilder enough to bring home the gold. I'm almost 100% certain. I'm 99.7% sure, sure. But where do we go from here? Well, <sighs> if Fury can pinch the belt off Wilder, it depends. I would, if I was booking it, I would let White have the crack at AJ next. To keep AJ in fighting form, to give White his rematch that I think everyone unanimously agrees that they would like to see, even if competitively it doesn't make sense given the nature of the knockout that he suffered. And given his recent performances, I mean, the, the performance against Parker was woeful. I, I thought that was a, a really bad fight for both of them. I mean, I don't know if you've seen it, but... Joseph Parker just left it way too late in the day, and White was literally out on his feet at the end of that. Gassed, but gassed maybe two rounds to go. And I mean badly, like staggering on their feet, just throwing, like not, the, the term throwing a punch, I think really shone in that fight, because when you're punching, you kind of throw it, but when they teach you to box and they teach you to box properly, they teach you to retract your hand back to make sure that you're constantly defending yourself. Like, you don't just throw the punch and leave yourself exposed because that's that's a death sentence in boxing. You'll overextend, you'll leave your chin exposed, you'll leave your, your, your obliques exposed, uh, and, and someone will nail you, wind you, or, not, or worse, knock you out. So it's not really throwing a punch, it's really extending and retracting. But these guys were throwing their hands, not caring in the slightest as to whether or not they could retract them back to defend themselves properly. It was a bad fight for both of them, but Joseph Parker is world calibre. He's a big guy, he's 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 a good 16, 17 stone, technically proficient, it's just I think he choked against AJ. He didn't have a winning formula there. And I think he left it just way too wet against, uh, late against White. If he'd have put that beating on White two rounds earlier, he would have probably won. White was very, very lucky the ending of that fight occurred when it did because I think Parker could have finished him. But, as history will remember it, White came through with the win. Which means that if anyone's staking a claim to the next shot at a world title, it's White. And so, given that Fury and uh, Wilder are going to be fighting very, very shortly, AJ still doesn't have an opponent lined up yet, and you've got to think he's going to want to soak up that world title as soon as possible, he needs to stay active. Take on White, beat White, set up the fight with Fury, and have the undisputed heavyweight championship on the line in the UK the home of boxing at the moment, I don't care what anyone else says, I get that there's the big Canelo Alvarez deal, but at the moment, really, the UK is where boxing is at. Have that undisputed title match, and again, I'm leaning more towards Fury because of the way he can nullify fighters, but man, if I wouldn't want to see an AJ Fury fight, I'd love to see that fight. It'd be absolutely amazing. So, what I'm interested to hear from you guys is, What's your prediction for the Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder match? Do you think I'm talking shit? I'd like to think I have an idea about boxing because I've I've studied it. I watch a lot of the fights back to back and I've watched them in context as well. And I just feel that even with Fury's relative inactivity, having uh, one comeback fight so far, which everyone pretty much unanimously decided was a shit fight, it was a terrible fight. But the guy is nearly seven foot tall. The guy is 18 stone. The guy has the technical prowess that a lot of other heavyweights lack, specifically Deontay Wilder. And Wilder has an overinflated perception in the United States based on his KO record, which is very, very impressive. And I can't say people knocked out. But what I will say is that I once saw him sparring with an internet troll. He got put gloves on him and tried to beat him up. He didn't knock the troll out. 
so and the guy was untrained weighed maybe three or four stone less was about a foot shorter you expect me to believe Tyson Fury can't take him out please so that's boxing for you let's move on to our final topic of this podcast talk about some MMA stories I haven't seen the Liddell Ortiz fight but I know the result. Liddell was pretty comprehensively beaten in the first round, uh, or the second round. I, I don't know, the, I, I, so the terrible, terrible reviewer, but I know that Liddell lost. Uh, I know that Ortiz was supremely confident going in, grew in confidence throughout the fight, and finished Liddell. I also understand going into this fight, Liddell's training was, uh, people were apprehensive about his safety going into this. He's 49 years old. His chin was compromised back in 2008 or 9, if memory serves properly. And Ortiz is uh, had neck surgery a couple of years ago, had discs fused or, or replaced and all the rest of this shit. So we're talking about two guys that really should not have been allowed to fight. But they were. And they did. And it was a fucking sideshow. And... The reason why I wanted to talk about this is because it really does need to serve as a cautionary tale to, to fighters within the industry. Because how can it be allowed that these... I mean, because we, we always make... Uh, again, as mere mortals, we, we criticise sportsmen for cr- complaining and wasting away their fortunes and squandering their, uh, squandering their wealth. But they are still fallible humans at the end of the day. However... When your expectancy in terms of a career is so short, why is there nothing in place in the 100, 200 years that the pugilistic entertainment element of our society has been regulated to some extent? Why is there no fund, no organization, no plan in place for these guys once they retire? Why is there nothing that when they sign up and they say, right, okay, I want to be a fighter, right, well, here's what we do to make sure you're not on your ass on the back end of your career. You sign away a percentage of your earnings, your winnings, you pay into a fund, like, and we take care of you. We take care of it, we invest the money, we make sure that you are okay once you are done. Because we can't have you fighting until your late 30s, early 40s. These guys are fighting until they're nearly 50. How is that allowed to happen? And number two, why have they ended up having to do that? It's a... I'll go so far as to say it's a disgrace for MMA. It really is. Ken Shamrock is bad enough. He's he's a terrible example of someone that really has had fight after fight that shouldn't have been sanctioned. But this one is bad because everyone knew how bad Liddell's his his mind and his 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 fragility is going into this you need only see the list of boxers that have suffered irrevocable brain damage as a result of cte as a result of continued punishment this sort of shit shouldn't be allowed and it makes me sad more than anything else because it was it was a result that a lot of people predicted and rightly so um, yeah, it's just a bad one. But what do, what do you guys think? What do you think about Liddell fighting Ortiz? Are you okay with 50-something-year-old guys getting into the ring? What happens? Because we're all about equality here on the Halcyon Show. Are we okay with the same with women? You know, if Cyborg and Amanda Nunes have their fight, but in 20 years' time from now, because it is that, it's 15 to 20 years' time from now is, is the equivalent, are we going to want to watch them? fight again I would like to think no because I would like to think that no one wanted to see this fight but we've not seen the pay-per-view figures come out yet I hope it, in a weird way as much as I want them to get paid for their endeavors I hope it did badly so it dissuades them from doing it again but we'll see what do you guys think Liddell Ortiz did you watch it uh, what were your opinions what were your thoughts on it so let's move on let's, let's, let's move on because that's a that's a really fucking depressing topic let's talk about Jones Gustafson predictions outcomes and the wider ramifications also want to draw some comparisons one that I've made in a previous podcast so uh, Jones versus Gustafson Jones obviously coming off of a, a steroid suspension for 15 months uh, Gustafson hasn't fought in a considerable amount of time due to a combination of issues 
but their bout previous was one of the closest that Jones has ever had. And Gustafson has been dying for another crack at the title, which we've is is all but confirmed now that it, uh, uh, Daniel Cormier will be stripped of the light heavyweight championship, and the winner of this fight will be crowned the new champion. Jones, I think, is probably going to win because he is still held in that higher regard by everybody. It's hard to see any other result. It will be a shame if Gustafson doesn't give a good account of himself. I do hope it goes to a decision. It's not very often. I don't hope that a fight gets finished. But at the same time, Gustafson really... Uh, he needs he needs some kind of redemption from this situation. Because he's been, he's been defined to a certain extent by Jones. And Jones has refused to give him any kind of credit. At least DC has been given the credit of being... Called Jones's rival. Gustafson has been dis discarded to a large extent by the MMA fan base, which is a shame because Gustafson's a big guy, he's a good fighter. But the comparison I wanted to draw at this stage is Jones, because his public image right now is somewhat interesting. He is now embracing his heel persona in a way that we've never seen before. He's always had this mean streak to him, but these days he just doesn't... I mean, at the press conference, he stood in front of Gustafson. Gustafson stood in front of him as a response. Jones then pushed him, and Dana White jumps in and says, For fuck's sake, guys, this is New York. You need to stop. We can't afford any more of this bullshit. So, as interesting as that was, it's Jones just being Jones at this point. He is the heel. Why do I talk about this because at least Jones had the presence of mind to turn heel when he did for the longest time he was portrayed by his management team by himself and by the wider MMA media as a whole as being a babyface if you don't know what those heel and babyface are google it you'll get it um, but then obviously all of his transgressions come out in the media and it's impossible then to define him as a babyface Anthony Joshua I feel can follow a similar path I really do because he is that good and he has that kind of following that I think he could get away with it now and the reason why I say he should is because I have heard stories I've read stories I have seen elements of his game and I've seen elements of him when he's been fighting that tell me that there is a mean streak lurking somewhere within there. There's something about that smile, that smug grin, that at the moment is being portrayed as a wholesome face, a smile that radiates goodness and feeds puppies and dandelions. To me though, there's a, there's a smile there that says I would murder you and your entire family if I needed to. There's a smile there that says I would, I would burn all of this to the ground if I absolutely had to because I, I am about me I'm about my success, my goals, my dreams my aspirations, I am the most important and you can all go to hell if you don't like that and I love that I love that there's a potential heel, a legitimate heel in boxing, as much as Mayweather likes to think he's the heel in the situation, and he is but he's He's the mouthpiece. He's like a manager in terms of his stature. Like, let me put it to you this way. As much as Mayweather is undisputably one of the best boxers of all time, and no one can touch him within the realms of boxing, I bet most of us would actually fancy our chances against him in a fight. As ill-advised as that is, he's still a boxer. He'd still punch your fucking face in. But because he's diminutive... Because he's very lean, and because he's got kind of a jokey persona, he doesn't have a very threatening persona, most guys, especially if you give him a couple of drinks, would probably take a pop at him if given the opportunity. How many amongst you really fancies having a pop at Anthony Joshua? The guy is six foot five or six, I want to say. The guy is 17, 18, 19 stone sometimes of... Pure Adonis muscle. The guy's fucking shredded. And he's an Olympically trained boxer. With an undefeated record and heavyweight champion of the world. How many of you really want a piece of him? 
And that's when you get a really, a really special heel. A real special commodity in the entertainment business. Someone who you cannot beat. Now, you have him as, you have him on your side, you don't take him that granted, you know, you question this what people do right now. They question him right now. Is he really actually that good? Could Wilder knock him out? Could Fury knock him out? Blah 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 blah. Put him as a heel. You make him mad, you make him evil, you make him bad, bad man. Suddenly he seems all the more threatening. He seems all the more, uh, uh, he has a, a presence to him that is, is almost unquantifiable. People fear him now. He's got that in his locker. I really feel he does. And I really feel that if he's allowed to express it, if one day he's allowed to not be the squeaky clean baby face that every fucking advertiser in the world likes and wants to put on the front of their fucking uh, uh, advertising billboards, you could have something really special in boxing that you haven't had for a very, very long time. Last true heel in boxing, I would argue, was Mike Tyson. People loved him, but he was a heel. He said he'd he'd eat people's children. He said he'd stomp people, destroy them. He bit a man's ear off. He went to prison for raping a woman. But people still watched it because he was a heel. And it took a underdog babyface by the name of Buster Douglas to take him down in one of the greatest upsets in sporting history. Now, unfortunately for Buster Douglas, that didn't translate into stardom for him, but it made for a great story. And I wonder whether or not a similar story could be told because Jones, as good as he is, he is a heel. And every story has to have the baby face going over. So while I would like, and this is where a bit of booking comes into play because I think Jones will win that fight. I'd like Gustafsson to give him a really good fight and I'd like it to go to a decision just to make sure he gets his due, but Jones could very well knock him out. Who knows? Jones versus his next opponent is a big one because it could be DC and it could be uh, uh, Lesnar. As a lot of people have touted, you know, DC, the third fight, uh, could it be a heavyweight to, to add a bit of extra spice to the mix? He threatened Lesnar at the end of his fight with DC before he was suspended. Let me tell you what I'd like to see. And this is one that I don't know if many people would talk about. I don't know if many people would want to see it. But it's it's a bit of wrestling logic. So you got Jones, who is a massive heel at this point. He's on the chase and he wins his belt from Gustafsson. But now he's done at light heavyweight. He's done. It's over. It's finished. He moves up to heavyweight. But he's not going to get a crack at the title straight away because DC is fighting Lesnar. Let's say that that's happening. So who do you stick him with? Who has credibility? Who has the wherewithal? Who deserves the shot? And who has the persona to adequately counter the babyface Jones for my money it's the guy that never got his rematch it's the guy that the UFC still diminish his standing within the wider context of MMA the heavyweight division it has to be Stipe Miocic I want to see Stipe Miocic take on John Jones it would be a fucking war for Stipe. Don't get me wrong. And Stipe took a beating uh, from DC prior to getting knocked out. People forget that. His face wasn't looking like roses prior to the fight. But considering Stipe never got his rematch against DC. Considering I don't think he will get his rematch against DC unless he does something to really shake up the division. Considering Jones needs an opponent that has legitimacy, that has that that name value, and I don't think it's quite right for Nganu to go into that mix. I think Stipe Miocic versus Jones would be an excellent fight, mass massive fight, excellent fight, technically excellent uh, storytelling perspective, 
the redemption path for both fighters. Seeking the opportunity for the heavyweight championship. One to reclaim it. One to reach the mountaintop. To emulate his great rival. Maybe even setting up a fight with his great rival down the line. And, and, and Stipe setting up a rematch. Potentially down the line. It offers you so much. And it means that the heavyweight division potentially could become one of the hottest in UFC, if not the hottest. Yes, there's still the question marks about McGregor, Khabib, Nick and Nate Diaz, what are they doing? Uh, GSP, is he coming back? One and all of the things that they're doing right now. Uh, ben Askren coming across. There's a lot going on, but in terms of wider ramifications and in terms of the impact it could have on the sport, the heavyweight division is where it's at for me right now. And when you've got... Brock Lesnar still not really sure what he's doing. DC given a deadline as to when he's finishing up. Jones back into the fold with Gustafsson. Both of those could 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 benefit massively from winning that that uh, that fight. And then Stipe still waiting for his fight, having taken on and beaten the monster and Garnu, who he himself has just come off the back of winning to reset to reestablish himself. Um, you've still got Derek Lewis somewhere in there, but I think it's it's fair to say he's not world championship caliber. So you could always have someone go through him as a test. Man, it's exciting as fuck. And I'd love to see Stipe get his shot back because I really like Stipe as a fighter and as a character. And I think he's been undersold by the UFC to a certain degree. He deserves that. Because again, he, in his fights, where's his money fight been? He hasn't had a money fight so far. He doesn't get to face Lesnar. He didn't get to call out Lesnar. He, he was called and asked to fight on a card that had fuck all on it by going up against DC, who probably is a natural heavyweight. It's an interesting situation, and for, I, for one, would love to see Jones versus Stipe, assuming Jones can come through the fire of Gustafsson. So, to wrap up this podcast, what do you guys think? Who, who among you watches MMA? In terms of the heavyweight division, what are your aspirations and hopes for what they do with the division? Uh, in terms of the welterweight division, what do you see going forward there? Uh, 185, 205. Uh, the women's division, you've got Nunes and Cyborg coming up shortly as well. So what are your predictions for that fight? And uh, who else do you think Who else you seeing coming up? We've also got Anderson Silva versus uh, uh, Israel. Oh, gosh, I'm going to forget how you pronounce his last name now. But that's a that's a huge fight because I like Israel. He's, his interviews have been quite cool. And Anderson Silva coming back. That's that's huge news. So there's a lot going on for UFC at the moment. And it's interesting to see how it's all going to unfold. So let me know what your thoughts are in the description below. What some of your fantasy booking ideas are. Or who you'd like to see fight who. And what you'll think the outcomes are going to be. So in the meantime, please like, share and subscribe. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of the Halcyon Podcast. I've been your host, Lorne Risley with a sore tongue. I hope you're checking out some of the other podcasts. The PWT dropped today as of the recording of this podcast. Uh, also, Crazy Taxi, my Blink review uh, for the week went up. Uh, you'll get a review next week, Sunday. Uh, there'll be another one last podcast this week. Uh, more general gaming, uh, channel updates, social updates, things of that nature. That'll be dropping in the next day or two once I've recorded it. So I hope you're staying tuned for all of those. I hope you're also tuning in to GFY Productions. He's been making a few videos. The dude is getting better. Glad to really glad to hear he's doing he's doing so well. Uh, the Bash Bros they're producing uh, content again on a regular basis. Most recent video I saw of theirs was the Christopher Robin review, uh, live action Disney shit being churned out every single way, and they're gonna watch it for me because they are lads. And of course, uh, last but not least, Defunct Games. Uh, he's producing content that's fucking blowing. The, the The award show that he's just posted recently was fucking unreal. Honestly, if you've not, I'll, I'll try and remember to put a link in the description, but that show was unbelievable. That was an amazing fucking video, and I hope you're all supporting him. So, in the meantime, and once again, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, follow me on Twitter, as always, and please take care of yourselves, and I will see you on the next edition of the Halcyon Podcast. Mm -hmm.